Well, thank you, Johan, Anna, and a very good morning to all of you. It's my job to set up the discussions today, and I'm going to do this by presenting some of the key findings from the background paper on how to improve the relevance of humanitarian action. Now, providing what people need in a crisis is obviously one of the most basic elements of humanitarian assistance. But the mismatch about what people really need and what they receive has been a problem for decades, and unfortunately, it still is. And my starting point in this presentation is to take a brief historical look at the kinds of problems that have arisen over the years and how they have been conceptualized and explained by academics and policymakers. I'll then go on to address two key questions. How can we understand our capacity to, uh, about the true priorities of affected people? And what tangible steps can we take to provide what they really need? So let's begin with what is relevance. Of course, it's part of our everyday vocabulary, judgment, and experience. But it's also a concept that lies at the heart of our political systems, industries, and professions. It's one of those things that's hard to pin down, but we know when it's not there. At ALNAP, we describe relevance as being closely connected to what's important. And I'm sure all of us would agree that this should be a guiding principle of all humanitarian work. And recent evidence shows that we can get it right, and we do get it right, as reported in the last ALNAP State of the Humanitarian System report, which has been monitoring and reporting on relevance for the last 10 years. And the findings show cause for optimism, as humanitarian interventions were generally successful at addressing people's most urgent basic needs. But it's also the case that there's a long way to go, and sadly, humanitarian history is also full of stories of irrelevant aid. And indeed, this point was brought home to me in, in what was probably the first ever critique of humanitarian action, Imposing Aid, written by the late Barbara Harold Bond in the mid-1980s. Now, I remember when it was published and how it sent shockwaves through the fledgling aid community as it was then. The book described the disparities of power between the aid communities and Ugandan refugees in Sudan, and gave a first-hand account of how a myopic aid system, driven by its own values and cultures, ended up making things worse rather than better. And since then, we've been regularly reminded that variations of this problem are still with us. And most of you will remember the iconic image of a little girl in the city of Safwan in the first Iraq war with a placard around her neck which said, we don't need food, we need safety. And some years later, after the tech evaluation of the Indian Ocean tsunami, we saw a story uh, uh, about a second tsunami wave of inappropriate aid, which bizarrely included a surplus of prosthetic limbs. And there are many recent examples, including displaced people in Iraq asking for information rather than just food and shelter, and people receiving inappropriate high-tech handouts in the Syrian refugee response. So, right from the early 1980s, right up to the present day, the challenge of providing relevant assistance is still with us. But why? Surely we should have solved this by now. Or is there something deep in the DNA of humanitarian response that inexorably drives wrong behavior? Now, I'm going to address this question more closely. But before I do, I want to tell you about a personal experience which I've been thinking a lot about in the run-up to this meeting. So let me take you back to 1989, when I was working on the development of an emergency registration kit and guide for Oxfam with a polite young man named Hugo Slim. Hmm, I wonder what happened to him. Um, the kit and the guide were based on first-hand experiences of aid workers in Sudan and Ethiopia who had tried, unsuccessfully, to register, vaccinate, and provide food aid to semi-nomadic pastoralist populations. 
And the guide provided a step-by-step -step approach to setting up a registration site, and the kit included registration cards, stationery, calculators, marker dies, megaphones for giving clear instructions, and 450 meters of rope. So the site could be delineated into safe areas before, during, and after registration. And we were also keen to stress that the affected population were kept informed and were part of the process itself. Now, the kit was considered something of an innovation at the time, although, to be honest, that word was not in the humanitarian lexicon then. But Oxfam were always keen to get the views of anthropologists and suggested that Hugo and I meet with Barbara Har Harold Bond to get her perspective. Now, those of you who had the pleasure and the privilege of meeting Barbara will know that she had no problem in speaking her mind, and she lost no time in critiquing our work. She was particularly dismayed by the megaphones and the rope, which she believed could have a dehumanizing effect on those being registered. And although she recognized that affected people were to be kept informed and involved in the process, she still felt that we could have done more to co-create the design. And in this way, she felt that it lacked cultural and contextual relevance. And to round it off, we were also told that like it or not, we were both unwittingly part of a self-reverential colonial project driven by its own values and ways of thinking. Actually, she said more than that, but I think you get the gist. Now, my defense at the time was that the kit was designed to safeguard aid entitlements by providing a really practical system that could be rolled out quickly in different locations. And we knew from our experience in East Africa that people needed to feel safe and confident in the registration process, and having a pre-made kit seemed like it could meet that need. At least, it felt like that at the time. But later, I began to wonder if Barbara was right. Maybe we should have made more effort to consult the pastoralist population. Maybe roped-off areas and megaphones did have a dehumanizing effect. Maybe we had been imprisoned by our own culturally conditioned outlook and had got this completely wrong. Indeed, this thought was in my mind when I first read this paper, and at the end of the presentation, I'll tell you what my thinking is now. But let's get back to the question I posed earlier about irrelevance being deep in the DNA of humanitarian response. There's been a lot written about this, uh, some of it by my esteemed colleagues in this very room, and I'll briefly mention two critiques. Now, the first is the Western-driven critique, which argues that the humanitarian system is rooted in the Western mindset of the people that set it up in the early to mid-20th century, and this has continued to shape its direction up until the present day. And in this way, the system is seen as paternalistic and is characterized by a significant imbalance in power relations between the Western elite and thousands of local smaller agencies. And the second is the supply-driven uh, critique, which argues that the mandates of humanitarian agencies dictate the response and are deeply embedded in the system's architecture. The imperatives of scale, speed, and efficiency favor a supply chain model the structure of a sector-based coordination system preset the response, and the politics of funding made it, makes it hard for agencies to change their offer. And on the basis of this theory, the solution is to move to a demand-based model of the kind favored by businesses with a client-centered approach. But the problem here, of course, is that although humanitarian does exist in a market, and asp aspires to commercial efficiencies, it still does not operate as a business. Now, all of us are going to recognize these arguments, and they offer us some useful explanatory models to help understand some of the underlying problems. But the frustration, though, is that the solutions to these problems, changing power relations or moving to a demand-led model, both require deep changes to the current business model. And without this, the same systemic problems keep coming up time and time again. And in the words of one well-known commentator, we are condemned to repeat. 
And we know that getting that deep change is not easy, as we found out at the last annual meeting in Stockholm, where we looked at the characteristics of complex adaptive systems and their inherent resistance to change. And I'll say more about this at the end of this presentation. So, given we accept the system is what it is, at least for the moment, how can we better understand what people really need? We know that information is often available. Demographic surveys and single joint and coordinated assessments are often carried out in crisis situations. For example, the needs overview for the 2017 Haiti Humanitarian Response Plan noted 100 assessments, and the one for Chad noted 29 multi-sector assessments. But experts still tell us that our understanding of needs is partial, flawed, and riddled with blind spots. So what's going on? Then the meeting paper helps us answer this question by laying out five key dimensions which can help understand what people really need. And to get a flavor of these, let me run you through three of them. So the first dimension is about seeing the full range of people's needs rather than those that we're conditioned to see either by our culture or our supply-driven model. Now, the good news is that progress has been made in improving multi-sector needs assessments and in the development of new methods and the ways of assessing priorities. But a major obstacle continues to be the lack of agreement about where the legitimate limits of humanitarian action actually lie. And this debate shows little sign of resolution. And the second dimension for better understanding is about inclusion making sure that sections of the population, even those that are not readily visible, are included. And over the years, we've developed a wide range of tools for considering gender, age, and disability, as the minister just told us earlier. And in many senses, this is a positive sign. But as Hugo Slim points out in a recent blog, there are also many factors that intersect to shape a person's identity, and labeling people, in some cases, can be reductionist and inaccurate. So, echoing what Barbara Horrell Bond said to us, the challenge is to see beyond this and recognize the strengths and capacities that each person carries with them. And the third dimension focuses on how to listen and make sense of many different narratives that coexist within a population, even though some of them may contradict each other. Now, a complex array of data does not automatically equate to a complex understanding and has a natural tendency to overlay one single narrative on multiple assessments. And increasingly, there are now demands for a different approach to assessments which use a different model of engaging, listening, and analyzing, one that is less reliant on extracting predefined information from, from people and then analyzing it externally. So clearly, understanding need is trickier than it might first appear. And even if we manage to get a more comprehensive, inclusive, and narrative-savvy understanding, we still need to find ways to use this to make decisions about programming. And to help us do this, the meeting paper then goes on to identify a number of key lessons from good practice. So let me run you through a few of them now. And the first lesson, it's how to tailor assistance to meet the demands of marginalized groups. And there's a lot of work to be done here. The findings from the World Disasters Report found that untailored responses leave older people with food they can't eat, health care that doesn't treat their conditions, and livelihood options they can't access. But we are seeing improvements in other areas, and the state of the system found marked improvements for women and girls. And this is a positive sign. And the second lesson is about ensuring that assistance is co-designed with effective people, again, as pointed out to me all those years ago by Barbara Harold Bond. If assistance is to be re relevant, there's a strong case for involving people to actively engage in its design and its delivery. And on the positive side, we've seen an increasing use of feedback mechanisms and good practices amongst Syrian refugees in Satari camp, to name just one example. On the other hand, we know from ground truth surveys and other evidence that these rarely result in genuine partnerships between effective people and agencies. 
And here again, we come up against the argument that a Western-driven model acts as a barrier to power imbalances. And this throws up the dilemma of how to handle the clash between affected people and the views of aid experts. Indeed, this exact issue will be debated in plenary today at two o'clock, so hopefully all of us will be more enlightened afterwards. And the third lesson is about staying relevant to people's changing needs. So rather than relying on an upfront design, humanitarians need to keep up with changing circumstances. And recent ALNAP work suggests that this will involve adapting in a number of areas, including where assistance is delivered and how, changing to whom dis, uh, assistance is given, adapting or changing the product and service, and possibly even changing roles and functions entirely. And there are positive examples from the first two areas, from agencies shifting locations to follow changing patterns of movement in a response to the European migration crisis, or rethinking the targeting and assistance of IDPs in Afghanistan. And a fourth lesson is about locating humanitarian assistance as one part of a wider set of contributions from other sectors, so that people will have more choice to meet priority needs. And several policy agendas are helping us to promote collective relevance, localization, cash, and the nexus, again, all mentioned by the minister earlier, and all of them provide new imperatives for thinking about our role as a wider effort to promote a menu of complementary assistance. So where does all this leave us? It's true that the humanitarian system has struggled to resolve the relevance challenge and is still struggling. The relevance gap manifests itself in different ways and requires difficult trade-offs, especially in the light of limited resources. Trade-offs between meeting immediate needs and longer-term needs, meeting the needs of the few, and meeting the needs of the many. And, as I alluded to earlier, our supply-led humanitarian system, with its inherent power imbalances, does not lend itself to providing more relevant aid, and it's inherently resistant to deep change. But it's also the case that change at the level of individual organizations and projects can combine and improve the match between what's offered and what's needed. And this can and does prompt systemic change and improvement. And indeed, this was my most single important takeaway message from the last annual meeting in, in Stockholm. So finally, let me get back to the challenges laid down to me by Barbara back in 1989. So with many years of hindsight, I still go back and forward with some of the arguments she presented. And we may well get a flavor of this in, in the debate I mentioned earlier. But there's one thing which I believe she did get right, which is that we need to get away from the simplistic idea of supply and demand and think about humanitarian assistance as something which is at least as much relational as transactional. And with that thought, I will finish, and I wish all of you a very happy and fruitful meeting. Thank you.